Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Ferraro. Uh, thanks very much for having me here at this uh, program here today. Um, I'd like to talk to you guys a little bit about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is uh, being an engineer, in particular, how someone in your position can make the transition from where you are to being uh, in an actual position as a professional engineer. So that's uh, the, the content of today's talk. Um, I guess I'll, I'll move right ahead and jump in. Uh, some background on me, I'm an aerospace engineer. That means I design satellites and spacecraft. I work at a company called Planet Labs, which is based in San Francisco. We build little satellites like this. Um, the company actually maintains many satellites. We're going for about 150, hopefully by the end of the year. But as of right now, we've got about 55 of them. Um, and they form this huge, complicated mess of orbits. And they're, they're orbiting the Earth all day and night. And it's a very complicated, complex machine. Um, but it's a very fun one to work with. Uh, other things that I've done in my life, uh, I worked on, on different rockets. This, for example, is the Ares-1X, is uh, one of NASA's rockets from a couple years ago. Um, this is LADEE. This is a spacecraft that was built right here at, at NASA Ames. How many of you guys have seen NASA Ames? Is that, you know where NASA Ames is? Great. NASA Ames is a phenomenal place, and they offer internships for people as young as high schoolers, so you should absolutely apply. Anyways, this is a satellite I worked on at NASA Ames. This is called LADEE. It went to the moon. And at the, end of its, uh, at the end of its long mission, it actually crashed into the moon. And so now, when I look at the full moon, I get to look up at night, and I get to see that in that big white orb that humanity has been staring at for thousands and thousands of years, a part of it is something that I touched with my hands. And that's a cool feeling. That's what it's like to be an aerospace engineer. I studied at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, it's a very technical school, and it's, uh, it's got this beautiful dome out front that we sometimes like to dress up in different costumes. Uh, do you guys know who R2-D2 is? Is that too? OK. <laughs> Good, everybody does. So I think I, it might be necessary to answer the question, why engineering? I mean, why, why would you want to do something like, uh, as difficult as engineering? And for me, it comes down to things like this. Uh, engineers, they, they look out in the world and they find problems. They find things that are difficult for humans and they make them better. You mean, if, if an engineer sees a big uh, gaping chasm, they build a bridge around it. Or, and it's not just these big colossal infrastructure problem, problems that you've seen before, but it's all these tiny things too. So for example, this is a heart stint. Uh, this is to make it so your arteries stay healthy and you don't have a heart attack. All these different manners of problems, this is what engineers get to work with. Um, and it's not just the the life or death, big kinds of problems. It's also just fun problems. Um, how many of you have seen this before? This is Big Dog. Yeah, this, these people have seen it. Big Dog is made, it's basically a cart to carry equipment, but you can't knock it over. It's, a, it's more like an animal. It's more like a, like a horse almost. It's kind of creepy. But it's just crazy. I mean, who came up with this kind of, this kind of idea? Um, something like this. This is Jetman Rossi. He wanted to fly like an airplane. Not in an airplane. He wanted to be an airplane. And so he built this, this uh, big wing that has jet engines strapped underneath it. And now he flies like an actual airplane. He is a jet aircraft. And it's just like, who comes up with these types of things? This is, I think... <laughs> Engineers just do the craziest things sort of for fun. <laughs> so hopefully I've convinced you that engineering is at least something fun that you might want to engage in. And um, I guess the rest of the talk is how to get from here to there, how to become someone who is uh, an engineer. And uh, I broke it down into not a step-by-step -step guide, but at least a series of guidelines. Um, I think the, the first, first and most important thing is to start young. Start right now, in fact. Um, practice daily. Whatever it is you want to be, I mean, maybe it's an electrical engineer, in which case, get yourself some wires, take apart an old TV. Or maybe you want to be a mechanical engineer, in which case, um, go into the garage and just start taking things apart. Your parents will be fine with it. It's fine. Uh, for me, that journey started with Kinex. Have, have you guys played with Kinex before? Yeah, tons of people. Uh, for me, it started with Kinex, in particular, building little Kinex trucks for my Beanie Babies. Uh, this is my sister and I when we were really young. Um, eventually, I started building larger things, sort of artistic projects, um, onto these crazy large kits that, uh, that were almost difficult to comprehend, and then onto my own large designs. Um, and I, I think what I'd say about this is it doesn't matter what your tools are. It doesn't matter if it's Legos or Connects or a bunch of wires, um, pieces of wood or scraps of metal. If you want to be an engineer, just pick something up and just do it. Just go for it. That's all it takes. And this is about as far as I got. Uh, with Connects, at least on my own, because I think the next big important thing to keep in mind 
learned is to uh, surround yourself with people who will push you, um, with people who are going to force you to become better versions of yourself. Uh, for me, that was in uh, Science Olympiad. Do you guys have Science Olympiad around here? Is that a thing you've heard of? Yeah, I think so. Um, for me, Science Olympiad was a team of other intelligent uh, people just like me who wanted to design and build projects. I mean, that's why you're here, right? This is design code build. <laughs> this is the kind of thing you get to do in an organized group every day for years. Um, and in that kind of regimen, you can actually build up and become something. You can become great at something. Uh, my experience in Science Olympiad taught me a lot more about how to build certain things, in particular catapults. There's an event where you build a trebuchet. So then my cousin, who was always pushing me, uh, convinced me to build this trebuchet. Um, I'll go ahead and play the video. Now we wanted to build this giant thing out of wood, but we didn't have enough money to go to the store and actually buy any wood. But we did have a backyard full of trees, so we went into the backyard and we cut down trees by hand, and then we stripped them of their of their branches and built this structure. You can kind of tell it's not the normal color. And this thing would launch 10 pound discs clear across the yard. Sort of a medieval siege engine. It's hundreds of pounds of weight about to fly around. Boom. Oh, oh, good shot. It's stuck in the ground. And that's the kind of thing that you can just do. I was, I think, I think I was 16 years old when I was doing that project. And um, it's a little bit dangerous, but if you know what you're doing, it's not hard. Um, other things that got, uh, Science Olympia got me into were things like this. This is a rocket. You, have you guys seen like Estes rockets? Have you built a model rocket before? Yeah, a couple people have. So you don't need an, a kit to build a rocket. You can actually build rockets out of just about anything. Um, this is one that me and my friend Alex built out of out of literally garbage. It was Christmas time, and we were just looking, going through the garbage pile, and we found uh, this big tube. Uh, this is a wrapping paper tube, and we've got some broken pieces of plastic at the, at the nose and at the uh, tail. And it turns out, um, it actually works just fine. So maybe rocket science really isn't that hard. Uh, at least that's what, so that, that, uh, that experience is actually what got me to apply to NASA. Um, you guys are really fortunate. There's only about 10 NASA centers in the whole United States, and you guys live right next to one. Um, I was lucky, too. When I was growing up, I lived in Cleveland, right next to Glenn. Um, but you guys live here in the Bay Area, which is right next to Ames. Um, they offer a variety of internship programs. You should really look into it. Um, but if you're talking about a place where people will push you, NASA is the place. Um, when I was a sophomore, uh, right after my sophomore year in high school, I got to work on this. This is the icing research tunnel at Glenn Research Center. Um, it's a wind tunnel that's also a giant freezer. And so they spray water into it and they simulate ice droplets uh, hitting the front edge of these wings and it'll, it'll form ice and it'll uh, disrupt the airflow around the wings. This is a really important problem and this, is, this type of research is why it's okay and why it's safe for people to fly across country in these big uh, Boeing jumbo jets and things like that. Um, shortly thereafter, I applied to MIT, and I thought I thought that NASA was a bunch of people who were going to push me, but MIT. That's sort of the uh, that's sort of the place to go if you want to be pushed. Um, MIT is beautiful. It's a big campus. It looks like this. Um, oh, this didn't come out. MIT is a crazy place. This is uh, one of the parties we had on a weekend. We built a roller coaster, so that. <laughs> so that we could just play around and have fun on a roller coaster. This is, um, uh, for scale, you know, the little cart would go up here and humans would ride up and down the loop. Uh, they built machines like this. This is a person spinning around and around on a bunch of different axes, sort of like those uh, training machines that they put astronauts in. It was, a, it was a crazy place. I mean, it was the kind of place where on a Friday you might find yourself building a six-foot-tall replica of a rocket out of cake for the yearly cake competition. Um, and then on Saturday, this giant helicopter airplane would land on the soccer field, just because no one was using it at the time. Uh, it was a very challenging place. And in fact, at the end of your sophomore year, if you study aerospace engineering there, at the end of your sophomore year, you have to design, build, and then fly a remote control airplane from scratch. Uh, this is my team's. And you have to fly two laps around. And so on my, this is the second lap. We're running out of power. We don't know if we're going to make it. And in fact, we get really close to the ground here. We just barely make it. And I lose control. And I crash it right into my professor. It's probably the most famous person I've ever like, hit with a remote control airplane. 
Um, when I was in college, I spent my summers, you have to do something with your summers. Um, I spent my summers working at NASA. Um, in particular, I worked on a project like this. This is the Ares-1 rocket. I was working on the emergency abort mechanisms. Um, this is, again, LADI. This is uh, another facet of LADI. It's very interesting is that it used a laser modem to create a wireless link between the moon and the Earth. And it was something like 600 megabits per second, so faster than your home internet, but to the moon. Uh, but I think the most special thing about NASA is that the people around you just expect greatness out of you, and that's what you need if you're going to become great engineers. Um, these are just the people who lived right next to me. This is um, Olivia and Hannah. These, when I was at NASA, the people who lived right next door to me, um, their project was to build carbon nanotubes using a microwave oven, and they were able to do so in zero gravity. And so here's them testing it just casually in a zero gravity environment. You can kind of see how everything's sort of floating a little bit unnaturally. Um, and this is just common. This is the kind of thing that happens there, and this is the kind of hobbies your friends have. And I think that people, um, to get back to the, to the earlier point, projects are great, and I've, I've stressed a lot of the ones that I've worked on, but projects are not going to get you nearly as far in life as friends who can make you into better versions of yourself. Um, so try to find that in other people and try to be that for your friends. Uh, last thing I want to say about how to become an engineer is to, is to try everything. I mean, it doesn't matter if you if you think you're going to fail at something, try it anyways. Fail all the time. I mean, I'm the one who got to put this presentation together, so I put all my successes up here. But I've actually got a ton of failures, too. Probably more things that I've worked on have failed uh, than have succeeded. This is a quad rotor that I worked on uh, in college, and it never got off the ground. It was ex it's actually extremely dangerous. Um, this is sort of a steam-powered bicycle car that I thought would work, and it, it barely, barely moved at all. Um, and this one, I think, is, is one of my worst stories. Uh, I had a job working construction at one point, and I was framing a house. And I've got this huge, uh, this huge nail gun in my hand. It's a big, expensive piece of equipment. And I'm hanging from my knees in the rafters on the second story of one of these buildings. And you're, you're nailing the boards into place, like ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And I don't know if I was just getting tired or if I was losing focus, but I put my hand in the wrong spot, and I went ka-chunk. And suddenly, my hand, the nail went right into my hand. And I'm in this very precarious position. I can't just jump up and start screaming and carrying on. I'm in a very dangerous spot. So I had to think very calmly. I had to yank my hand off of the nail. And then using one hand, I had to hang up this very expensive piece of equipment in the rafters so that it wouldn't drop and fall. Then I had to crawl from rafter to rafter off of the frame of this house until I found my ladder and climbed down to the bottom of the ladder, then I could scream and yell and talk about how much my hand hurt. And that made me realize that maybe construction wasn't for me. Um, don't be scared of that kind of thing. You're going to fail a lot. You guys are young. You're going to have so many different projects ahead of you. Um, don't be scared of it, because as many times as you fail, um, you will have little bits of success here and there. And every once in a while, it'll turn into something really magnificent. Um, this is something that I worked on that we honestly thought was going to fail. This, was a, uh, this is called PhoneSat. We built it at NASA Ames. The idea was to build a spacecraft using a, uh, an Android phone as the primary flight computer. I mean, who knew that it actually it would work just fine? And in fact, this satellite um, turned into this satellite, which turned into the Dove, which I've got a, a model of here. This is the type of satellite we build at my company. Um, and in fact, uh, this one went so far that we actually built a few of these and put them in space. And here, this is the International Space Station, if you haven't seen it before, um, deploying some of our little satellites. And they're just this. They're exactly this size. And they're flapping their little wings. They're called doves. So I guess in closing, I'd just like to say, if you're wondering how to get from where you are to where I am, all you have to do is just start today. Keep working, work every single day, fail a ton, and surround yourself with good people. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you. I would love to take questions. Yeah. Great. I think some of you probably have some questions. Any questions so far? Hands up with questions at the back there. Start. Yeah. Um, 
when you built the rocket with the um, junk that you found in the trash on Christmas, did the rocket burn up completely when it flew up? Um, that is a very common problem with rockets that are made out of garbage, is they do burn up a lot. Um, it burned up almost completely, but I grew up in Cleveland where there's tons of snow, and we did this uh, in the wintertime. So even though it was sort of on fire as it came back down, uh, it got extinguished when it hit the snow. Great, we've got another question on this side back here. What do you think is the best college or university for, for architect or engineering? Wow. That's a great question. I think there are a lot of really good universities, both in the United States and abroad. Um, I would actually caution you, probably try not to think about it that way. It's not about any one university that's better than all the others. There are a whole ton of different universities. And what you want to find is one that's a good match for you. Um, you don't want to try and uh, put a bunch of fake stuff on your application, and pretend to be somebody you aren't. You want to find somebody, uh, you want to find a university that is a good match for your personality. Um, there are many, there's so many out there that are, uh, that are good at teaching those skills. One here. How hard is MIT? <laughs> Very hard. <laughs> uh, MIT is probably the, was, so I was there for four years to get my undergraduate degree. Uh, it was probably the hardest four years of my life. Um, outrageously difficult. I mean, as, as difficult as you can imagine anything, uh, times 10. Um, <laughs> I really can't stress that enough, <laughs> but, but it's worth it. I mean, so many people, um, so many people struggle, and, and I think what MIT does to you, it's a very particular brand of teaching. Um, I thought that engineering at MIT was going to be this, uh, this sort of linear ramp up where you'd learn something today and tomorrow and the next day, and it would just be a sort of linear progress. Um, but that's sort of not what MIT was like. MIT was more like, I imagine it as someone bashing on a door, just trying to turn you into an engineer, and they're bashing on the door, and eventually at some point the door breaks, and you become an engineer. Like something inside you changes, um, and uh, for me that was, that was actually sophomore year, but it happens to everybody. Um, absolutely worth it, the hardest thing you'll ever go through, um, but you become, you become quite an engineer afterwards. There are lots of fields of engineering. What probed you to be an aerospace engineer? Right. Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, when I was growing up, I had this mail subscription service that would send me these little packets uh, every week. And it was something like a new pamphlet. And, and each pamphlet would be about like, uh, something to do with space. It would be about quasars, or it would be about Andromeda Galaxy, or about the International Space Station. Um, and I would just read all of these and absorb all of it for so long, and I was probably seven or eight, um, that I, I just couldn't see myself doing anything else. Um, I had to work with space. I had to work with, uh, with satellites. Yep. So out of everybody that you worked with, who do you think was the best team, like who you put the most faith in? Whoa. Oh, what a profound question. Honestly, I think it's my current team. I think uh, the, the people at Planet Labs um, are some of the most gifted, talented, and hard, hardest working engineers I've ever met in my life. And um, I think that if I, had to, if I had to choose any one group to design something with, it would definitely be them. So I'm in a fortunate position. Have you ever taken a computer engineering into consideration? Computer engineering, yes. So actually, my, uh, my freshman year in college, I was trying to choose between um, computer science and aerospace engineering. And so I took one class in each of those departments, and I took the computer science class, and I hated it. <laughs> and I just could not see myself doing that. Um, it's a wonderful field, and I enjoy it very much as a hobby, but I could not do it professionally. Um, so yeah, I, I actually I had, to, I had to take classes before I understood that I couldn't do it. If you hadn't surrounded yourself with the right, with the right people, where do you think you'd be today? <laughs> Definitely not on this stage. <laughs> so right around the time I started making a conscious decision to surround myself with, that, with, uh, with good people, right around that time I was starting to get terrible grades. So I was in middle school at the time, uh, going into freshman year. I was getting C's and D's in things like science, math, and English. 
Um, I was this close to having to go to summer school, and uh, I just narrowly avoided it. Uh, I don't think that I would have gone on to an engineering degree. I definitely don't think I would have gone to MIT. Um, I have no idea where I'd be. I mean, maybe I would, maybe I would just be at home playing video games. Um, when, when you were studying in NASA, did you have fun there? Uh, who was asking? Oh, OK. <laughs> when I was studying at NASA, did I have fun? Oh, man, an incredible amount of fun. NASA is, um, so NASA Ames in particular, they have something like 600 interns every summer. And they, uh, they all live on base. So there's these big um, sort of like dorm rooms. And everybody lives right next to a bunch of other interns. And, and it was the most fun experience I could, I could even imagine. Um, on weekends, we would do things like we um, would go to the baseball diamond. And none of us played baseball. but we would use the, the, the cages that, that, that made up the diamond, all the, the chain link fence. So we made a giant slingshot one weekend that would shoot apples like 400 feet um, just because that was something we wanted to work on. And, um, it, was, it was an incredible creative outlet. Um, nothing more fun than that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so weird. When the Dove satellite was on the screen. Why did one of them have only one wing instead of two? Oh, man, great question. <laughs> so the, I'll show you. So this is a good model of the Dove. It's got these wings that sort of fold in and out. And when it's stored in the space station, um, there are these little screws on the side that are supposed to keep the wings in tight. Um, and sometimes the screws don't always hold as well as they should. And in fact, uh, what happened during that little video clip is that those, those satellites had been in space for quite a long time. And um, some properties of the screw made it not hold as well as it should have over all that time. Uh, and so when it deployed, it, you shouldn't have seen any wings. Um, but just because of the way the machine works, uh, the wings actually deployed. <laughs> So actually, one of the four wings functioned as intended. Uh, so I guess it gets back to fail often. Um, fail a ton, even when you're at that level. Um, All right, yeah. question. Yeah, um, what was it? Um, how long did it take you to design and build the Dove oh. for the first time? Great question. Uh, the Doves. I think the first design took about six months, maybe nine months, um, and that was build one. And then with every, every, after we finished build one, it wasn't just a design on paper. It was something we had actually built and put on a desk. And in the build process, we learned all sorts of things about what, what was really difficult. Why was it so difficult to put this satellite together? Um, typically, satellites take at least a year to assemble. And our first dove took probably two weeks. And that was way too long. So on the second build, we designed it for manufacturability. How could we make it quicker and better? And so every uh, three months, roughly, we got on a cadence of every three months, we would roll out a new version of the Dove. Um, and we would build one and put it on the table and see how well it worked. Um, and I think at this point, we're on our 13th iteration of the Dove. Um, I think this is a model of the 13. Uh, and at this point, uh, I think at this point, it's pretty mature. So uh, I think uh, it takes about one person one day to make one. One dove. So, yep. What degree did you get? I'm sorry? What degree did you get? What degree did I get? I got a, an undergraduate degree, a Bachelor's of Science, in aerospace engineering with an add-on called information technology. And that has to do with things like uh, control systems. Um, the, the joke in the industry is that it's easy to build a rocket. It's really hard to make a rocket go where you want it to go. Uh, and that's what that add-on is about, is about controls and, and uh, data handling, things like that. Yeah. Do you have any more advice for people pursuing these kind of careers? I think my, my biggest piece of advice would be that it's for anybody. You don't have to be someone you know, I come up here and I feel like I've got this, I've got this love for engineering. And if, if you don't feel such a huge love for engineering, that doesn't mean that you aren't cut out to be an engineer. Engineering is a skill. And it doesn't, you don't have to be in love with it from day one. And um, you don't have to be some sort of natural born genius that loves building things. 
it's a skill, just like any other, and anybody who wants to do it, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, or whether you're a guy or a girl, anyone can be an engineer. And, and if, you, if you have any reason to believe that you can't be an engineer, come talk to me and I'll convince you otherwise. Thanks. Um, from getting C's and D's in middle school, how did you end up spending your summers in NASA? <laughs> Well, I didn't put those C's and D's on my application uh, to NASA. <laughs> no, that's a great question, though. That's a pretty big transition, and it happened quite quickly. Um, I think for me, it all happened during freshman year when I joined Science Olympiad. Um, I happened to walk onto a team that was very good. Um, it performed typically uh, very well on the national stage. Um, I got lucky enough to make it onto the team, and in my first year, I was able to, uh, to succeed a lot. We actually went all the way to the national competition, um, and I won first place in a catapult building competition. Um, that combined with you know, the other trebuchets that I had built, um, all these different projects that I had worked on in my free time, that's the kind of thing that you put on an application. I mean, when I applied as a sophomore in high school to do a NASA internship, uh, they didn't let me in because I was somehow special and they wanted to reward me for getting good grades or anything like that. They let me in because I had a resume full of achievements, uh, engineering achievements. And, and that's what you're going to need to have when it comes time for you guys to apply for internships or for college or things like that, which is why I encourage you to start now. Um, you go. Great. Do we have any last questions? I think we have time for one or two more questions. Anyone? OK. I have one more question. So um, you talked a lot about some of the wonderful successes you had, and you showed us some great images of those in videos. And you also mentioned the failures you had. Um, and you also mentioned that it's important to fail and to kind of learn from that. Yeah. So how do you feel, um, what would you advise students um, and all of these wonderful creative minds here today, how would you advise them to kind of approach that in terms of when something doesn't go right, how could they learn from that? How can you best take what's happened and then move forward and apply that? I think the best thing you can do is remember it. I think you can, if you remember each and every one of your failures, then you're much more well equipped to pick out the types of projects that you think you can succeed at or the types of classes you think you can get an A in. Um, don't, don't try to write them off. Don't try and forget them because you're ashamed of them. Um, they're part of who you are. Uh, so definitely try to embrace them. Um, and don't get too mad about it because we all fail a ton. Don't get too frustrated. Awesome. One more question over here. Yeah. So if you could start your life over, would you do the same job that you're doing now? Absolutely. I love my job. Um, I think working with spacecraft is, is one of the most profound things that a human can do. Um, in my spacecraft right now, they, they tend to study the Earth. But I mean, a lot of spacecraft study other things, like the, the greater universe, the galaxy, the, uh, the the types of things that, um, that cause people to wonder, um, the types of things that inspire people. I mean, you think about, you think about like, say, the Apollo program. And that's, that's the type of program that inspired thousands of engineers for decades. And that's the kind of thing um, that if you, can, if you can be a part of the next one, if you can help inspire the next generation of people, that's probably the greatest thing you can do with your life. And um, I think that aerospace engineering is, is one of many fields um, that offers that type of incentive, but it's definitely the one for me. I think it's, uh, I hope it's the one for many of you too as well. Great. Any last words of advice for all these students as they're trying to figure out what they might do next? Ooh -hoo. Yeah. Uh, don't tell your parents I said this, but go home and find something. Find like a radio, an alarm clock, or um, any sort of tool and take it apart. <laughs> and see if you can put it back together. And the more complicated things, it's easy to take something apart, but the more and more complicated things you can learn how to put back together, um, that's going to be probably the most important thing for you right now, is, is learning how the things around you that exist today work so that you can one day invent your own new things. Um, but to do that, you've got to study. You've got to learn what's there. So don't, go, don't get your hands dirty. Just, just take something apart. Excellent. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful inspiration today. Big round of applause for our incredible rock star, Matt. Thank you.